Welcome to another Imaginomic video tutorial. In this tutorial, we're going to show you how the Imaginomic Real Grain plugin works. Real Grain features versatile methods for simulating grain patterns, color, and tonal response of different films and different scan resolutions to convey a truly film like image effect. With the various controls inside of Real Grain, you can just about simulate any type of look and feel of any of the old master's looks that you got out there. Plus you can also create your own for some unique looks that only you yourself will come up with. At present, Real Grain supports Photoshop CS3, CS4, and CS5. The different modes that Real Grain support are grayscale, RGB, and lab color in both 8 and 16-bit channels. Real Grain is run from the filters menu in Photoshop. Filter, Imaginomic, Real Grain, and as a case, I always recommend that you assign hotkeys to any type of filter you use. This is a real time saving factor. This is the Real Grain dialog as it pops up. We've got various aspects of it. It's similar to the other plugins, Portraiture and Noiseware, and then we have tabbed controls over on the left hand side that are slider based, and we have a preview in the middle, and then over on the right side, we have the OK Cancel and the uh, preview as well over here. We're going to go into some quick overviews of each of the various tabs that we have available here and kind of explain some overall use of how the plugin actually works. When you first come into Real Grain, it'll be in default mode. And what default mode is, it just zeroes out all the sliders in the tab and it's not doing anything to your image here other than some auto resolution down here, which won't really come into effect until the sliders start moving around. But for the Simple fact of when you're using the program, sometimes you'll get lost or you'll just make a lot of adjustments that come up looking real funky and you want to reset it. So simply go up to group, click on default reset, and then click the preset default reset. And we're going to drill down and show you a brief overview of each tab. And to start with in the grain tab, we have grain style here of two things. We've got film grain and we've got digital noise. Basically film grain strives to simulate the look of actual film grain that's in negatives, negatives that's been scanned in. And then the color noise itself or digital noise in here is just a method similar to Photoshop of adding a digital noise over the top of it. We're going to show you the two of them, how they work and all. We've got a grain intensity slider here that actually controls how much luminance grain we want to have in it and how much color grain. In most cases, you're not going to want to add color grain onto the image. Sometimes you may want to be simulating a noisy image for some type of a publication or something and you want to add some color in there. But in most cases, you're going to stick to the luminance, especially when you're working with film types. The grain density itself is just how much of the grain you want to add, low, medium, and high. The tonal range is actually one of the really powerful features of it is that you can put grain in only shadows, midtones, highlights, or any combinations of the three. And then the grain balance between dark and light, as if you look at black and white prints that have any type of grain in them, you notice that there's a dark and light contrast going on there. So you can work on a kind of a balance here or even customize your own look. And blue and yellow is when you're working with the color areas. You can actually add more blue or more yellow. Same thing with green and red. The grain size itself is an attempt to look at standard film formats. And we've got some standard in here, as you can see, as we drill down through them. And what this does is that if you select one of these formats is that it will attempt to simulate the grain size of that particular format. And it ties in with the type of preset that you have selected up here. Like if we go to a black and white film and then we select a particular type of film here like this. These are all 35 millimeter films here. So the 35 millimeter would be used if you want to simulate that particular type of film or you could say select a Tri-X 400TX and then come down here and change over to a 6x4.5, 6x6, whatever you want. And you're going to get a different overall look and feel to it, which sometimes can be very, very creative. In, in other words, you're not just stuck to that negative, how it's going to actually print out the grain it's going to have based on the ASA of the film and so forth. You're going to be able to have some a lot of control there and with, with just some canned settings. These are already in the software. You don't have to worry about that. Now the auto resolution and image blur down here is that you know when you enlarge, start enlarging uh, prints and trying to make bigger prints and, and the scans that are coming into them, you're going to have blur going on there. That's just, that's just part of the process. There's no way out of it. 
So basic Imaginomic is giving you the ability to up the scan resolution as if you were scanning it from, say, a high-end drum scanner or if you're down in some uh, smaller end flatbed or so forth. And then the image blur itself will actually blur the image and give it a more of a blurred out effect. And as I zoom in on this, you'll notice the image being blurred here. As I back off of it all the way, it'll come back. And that's one way you can really get a really, really super realistic look to an image. Because almost any, lar especially a larger print that's been made off of a smaller negative, it's going to be enlarged and there's going to be some blur going on in there according to how good it was focusing and all. And then the resolution itself will bring back in a little bit of the graininess edge to it because it's actually being able to pick up more of the grain that's in the film itself. So overall, you can get some really nice effects there, or you can just pull it back out and have a really edge-sharp look to it here just with standard uh, settings up here in these tonal ranges and then the grain intensity itself. I'm going to touch briefly on the color slider here. You'll notice now it shows that it's grayed out, and you'll also notice down here that the blue, yellow, and green, red are grayed out. And the reason behind that is because we have a preset that's set to black and white. So over in the black and white tab, as long as this convert to black and white is checked, then you won't be able to use the color part. So to be able to use it, you have to uncheck convert to black and white. Now we can go over to the grain area here and we can add color grain into it. And I'll zoom in here to give you an idea about what's happening there. Turn off the luminance. Just a pseudo color grain out there, as I mentioned earlier, if you want to do something that's trying to emulate some uh, noisy images or whatever. You see, we can go and, and give a blue tint to it and give a yellow tint to it. Green or red. We're going to start off with curve type. We've got some can presets in here, linear, medium contrast strong contrast, restore shadows, and restore highlights. And basically what these do is just what they say. So if we click restore highlights, you'll see how the highlights kind of dim down on the skin a little bit. And as you can see down here, all that happened was the highlights brightness slider just moved down minus 20. You go back up here, bring it back to linear. Now I'll just give you a little bit of an idea here. I want to bring in a little bit of a contrast to the image. I can just pull the midtones contrast up just a little bit. And you see that standard S curve come in here. I want to kind of pull in a little bit of contrast on those edges of the sh highlights there. You saw that come in. It gives a little bit more of an edgy look. If we go back and turn the grain off here really quick, like this, you see now you've got a, a nice edgy look to the image there as opposed to just the linear, more of a flat look to it. Pull some grain back into it. Back to tune. Go restore shadows. As you see it pull back to some of the shadows in there now which we could actually pull a little bit more contrast in on the highlights and get an even edgier look to it. And you notice the tone adjustment curve is just reflecting these settings up here. And the midpoint itself deals with the gray level, just similar to the gray level center indicator that's in the Photoshop's level controls down here. Now the uh, tone adjustment balance itself, because we have this set on black and white, we have to turn that off for that to actually come into effect down here. And what this does is that we got the luma only and colors tone. So if we move it over to the left, what's going to be happening is any of the settings we have on the contrast is going to be more luminosity based. If we go the other way, it's going to be more RGB based, in other words, color channel based on there. And that's a, something you have to really experiment to try to get some usefulness out of it whenever you're creating custom presets. The next tab we're going to move on to will be the color tab. And because we've been working in black and white, all the color controls are going to be grayed out. So we have to head over to the black and white tab and uncheck the convert to black and white. Then we go back over to the color tab and as you can see everything's ungrayed here now. It's basically a real simplistic control in that it's real common out there most all of your softwares that control any type of HSL or hue saturation lightness. In this case we call it brightness. You've got a master control here that overall saturates the image. And one of the things you'll notice about most of Imaginomic software is as you're using it that the values themselves don't go way out in the ballpark as far as, uh, especially when you're going up in values here, like saturation, you notice it's not just totally saturating it to the point of where it's really getting hit really hard. You could come down in here in the reds 
and yellows and greens and so forth and start moving the saturation up and get a little bit more out of it. But even then, it's not going to do what's really considered to be a heavy oversaturation like a lot of the tools you see out there in some of the programs like Photoshop. The hue is itself is a master. In other words, it's working on all the values in the image. And then the hue for the reds, yellows, greens, cyan's, blues, and magentas are all self-explanatory. That's just changing the hues of the color. The saturation, same thing, and brightness, same thing. Just say we wanted to brighten up the reds in the image and give them a higher lightness value. We just move it over to the right, and as you see, they change. If we want to make them look darker and more subdued, we can bring it down the other way. We're going to move over to the black and white tab over here now. For the conversion to black and white to have in this checkbox up here must be checked. As you can see, when I turn it off, it goes back to its original color values. We turn that on, and what it does is it desaturates the image to remove the color information. And then these controls down here that allows you to tell what part of each color is going to contribute to the overall resulting tone itself. This filter part right here, some of you in the past may have used color filters on your lenses and to get, achieve certain effects. So this isn't like adding a red tint on top of there. This is actually filtering the incoming image with a red filter based on the desaturation values here because we got black and white here. As we turn it off, you'll see the changes going on here. Very subtle. You can adjust these values either by clicking in this color bar down here and moving it back and forth, or you can grab the hue slider itself and move it back and forth. There's some predefined colors in here. You can scroll up through them with your mouse wheel if you have a mouse wheel on there or you can use your arrow keys to arrow up and down on them. We're going to turn off the color lens filter and then the color balance areas down there set the amount of each color and the resulting gray tone. Is For example, if you had positive values in the red, then that increases the red at expense of all the other colors and so it keeps overall brightness of the image the same. So if I move just the reds up, it's only going to increase the overall values of the reds here. It's not going to work on any of the other colors in there. And in the color response areas here, that sets the degree of sensitivity. So example, here we're going to say we want to work in this area, we want to work with all of the reds in the image. And then back here we're Backing it off, we're going to say we don't really work with any of the reds in the image. So color balance is the amount of it that's going to be worked on, and then color response is the actual response that's going to be applied to the image itself. The last tab we're going to deal with will be the tint and toning tab. Now, the toning toolkit enables the simulation of traditional black and white toning effects such as sepia, platinum, and others, as well as split toning effects. And we're going to drill down here and kind of give you an idea about what's going on. Uh, basically, in the shadow, just say if we select uh, sepia, and you'll see how the sepia immediately comes into the image in the shadows. If we come over here and we do the same thing on the highlights, you notice the highlight areas themselves come into effect. Most of the time, you'll have one or the other on for kind of a really nice look. If you get too heavy in the images and start putting a lot of the color tonings on top of them, they kind of get that painted over look. I'd always suggest to people is in the shadows is, is try them out first. Just scroll down through them. Again, you can use that mouse wheel to scroll down or the arrow keys themselves, and you can kind of get an idea. There's calotype, selenium, silver gelatin. And what's nice about it here is that you've got the ability to tweak these values out here. So when you get down to it, there's really no exact 100% digital way of recreating the metal processes out there in the wet uh, printing darkroom aspect and so this gets you some areas that you can look at them I mean, you could show it to 50 different old guys that print out there in the in the dark rooms and they'll all kind of give you a different opinion of what they think it is based on how the negative was dealt with and you know the, the film size of the paper itself the process itself there's just so many things in there that can vary that you just know way of getting this exact these are just starting points that you can work with. We highly recommend that you experiment and come up with your own look, it's which is what the masters did in the first place. This is why some prints look so much different to some people or even better to other people because they had their own way of doing stuff, even though they were basically using the same types of films, chemicals, and processes. They just had their own little tweaks that they come up with. So this is how we recommend 
you come in here as experiment with this area in here you can apply strengths to these values you can have a nothing on there or you can really max it out you can tweak the blue yellow and green red channels in there so that you can come up with some looks of your own and you notice as I'm moving these down that this area down here the split toning again this is the midpoint for your gray values here so if we move them over into the darker areas like this you see a change happen over in the background of the image if I head it over into the light area you see it overall change happens there because the gray values are changing there now we can use the same toner for shadows and highlights which is basically what this is going to do these values here are going to come down into this area there on the highlights and so and it turns off the highlights because you're using the same toner value whatever you move up here the corresponding cursor down here is going to move this is a way that you can go in and and kind of lock them together and get some really quick changes without having to go and just jump from one to the other if you want to keep them together so overall that's the tabs themselves and what i'm going to go into next is the overall use of the presets and then the actual interface of the software itself When you first open real grain, it'll be set to default on both the group and the preset. And what that does, that just zeroes out pretty much everything in there. It keeps the image in color. I'm going to drill down through some of these areas and show you what's going on. In the groups settings up here, groups are basically, we got them divided into color films, black and white, grain effects, split toning, other effects, and custom. I'm going to go into the color films and I'm going to show you some of the various color films that we have here. I'll zoom in on the image, give a little bit better look there. I'm just going to kind of scroll down through them pretty quick and just give you an overall and you'll see the changes that go there. And you'll notice some of the grains coming in on them as, as you get up into higher ISO, you'll see more grains coming in on them. You'll notice some various saturations that change because the different films all had different ways that they responded to capturing light and how they come out. Some of them are more saturated, some of them are less saturated. Some of them you'll see that have more contrast to them and so forth. But you probably recognize a lot of these films here. And then we've got some cross processing going on here. Flip down through a few of those. Now again, all of these are built in to the color films group. We've got some various black and white films here. Real common one right there. Notice that grain pattern that comes in there on top of it. There's some grain effects themselves to where you can take whatever the settings are and then you can Go along, you can darken the grain, the work on the shadows only. These are all built into it. These are various things that you can just experiment with. The split toning itself is where we're taking two basic color ranges and splitting the tones between the two. This is familiar to a lot of people out there in the industry. And then other effects, you've got some stuff like a black and white infrared, uh, color infrared and then we've got some things in here that kind of work good on some areas here like if I would just hit the enhanced sky that's going to kind of work on blues that are in the sky and make it look a whole lot cleaner and quicker and all and then we got some old photo looks here and then here's some of the digital noise that use the uh, color digital noise that I had mentioned earlier We'll zoom in there and you'll see a little bit of that coming into the image back in the background there. I'm going to go back to default reset. So anytime you have any kind of issue and you've experimented with it and you can't get it really going the way you want it, just go back to default reset on the group and then on the preset itself, click on default reset and it'll set everything back for you. Now if you want to save a preset out, just say that you've come in here and you've modified one of these presets like one of these color films and you've added a little bit of uh, heavy contrast to it and you want to save that preset out there you can come up here and click on the little blue floppy icon up here or you can press Control S save custom setting when you do that the save custom filter settings will pop up and you can call it a name 
and then you can specify a subset which each of these subsets are actually just the individual tabs that are up here like this normally you just keep those all on you click OK and then from that point on over in your group custom you'll have a preset right here you see where I've got this first one uh, GM Surreal 1 Cali when I select that you see what it's got there and here's the one I just saved out the test one so that's how you can handle the presets on there now with the red X up here beside that what you can do is you can delete a custom preset you just click on it and whatever the preset is selected at the time if you click yes it'll delete it these are the undo and redo here if I go in and start making changes on the filter itself and I come in here and I undo them as I step back one undo level then the the redo is going to be up here and here's the same settings as we've got in the other filters is control Z for undo and control Y to redo or you can just click on them with a the mouse itself and walk yourself right on back through the process which comes in handy over here on the preview side we've got the single preview which shows the actual image itself as it's being worked on we've got a split top and bottom this is before up top after on the bottom we got a split preview window vertically we got the before on the left after on the right right here we can actually add a new preview and you'll notice the previews come up here on tabs and then we've got the ability to do parameter bracketing with this icon here parameter bracketing is where you can grab a hold of one of the sets over here and you can actually use one of the values inside of there you can see we've got the grain tab over there and if I switch to the tone which is one that's active over there you'll see the shadows brightness shadows contrast and you'll notice that each one of these correspond to the left over here on these values over here so just say you want to work with the brightness and the tone of the image and you want to have five previews that built for you, you want a bracketing step of five and you want it to take over the open previews that are up there you just click okay and it generates them and it starts at the middle value and it goes five one way and five the other way in other words it's minus five and another minus five that's that's actually plus five which ten and plus five gives you minus and then zero so you can sit here and flip through these and look at them and say well okay there's a little bit of change going on there but not a whole lot And then you select the one that you really like the best out there. It comes in helpful sometimes when you're trying to be creative and you want to apply just a bracketed range of values to an image to see what it would actually look like. The percentage values down here with a minus and plus are just preview indicators. The minus will make it smaller, the plus will make it larger, and then it'll tell you the percentage value of the preview. Normally 25 and 50 percent are the values that I'd recommend that people use and don't get too carried away with it because if you go past 100 percent you're not looking at the real pixels anyway you're just looking at extrapolated versions of it on the right hand side we've got OK cancel help and about and anytime you've got the cancel up here it just means if you click it you're going to cancel whatever you've done it's not going to save it OK is going to go ahead and apply the settings and send it back over to Photoshop but at the same time if you hold down the alt key or the command key on the Mac the cancel button will change to reset and what that does is that resets it back to whatever the values were when you come into it so if I come over here and make some changes to an image I'm messing around with it and I go oh man I don't really like that and I don't want to have to uh, go back through a thousand undo clicks on there or keystrokes I just hold down the alt or the command on the Mac and click reset and it resets itself back to the initial values it was when it came into the image help is self-explanatory you click on it and a PDF file comes up and then about will come up and tell you uh, who your product's registered to, the version of it, and also your product ID. Now down here in the preview mode, you have a fast preview and an accurate preview. And generally, on most systems nowadays, the accurate preview will get by pretty good. On some slower systems, and on, especially with notebook computers, you may want to consider using the fast preview because you've got slower video cards, and it takes a little bit longer to redraw the preview on there. The navigator itself is real similar to Photoshop's navigators, when you, especially when you start zooming in over here. You've got the navigator box that you can just grab, click and hold, and drag it around, and the image will update. And as you notice, as I move around, it updates really fast, and it's very accurate previews. These aren't proxies that are going on. These are actual representations of the images themselves. 
So overall, this is the preview of Real Grain, and we hope you enjoy it and get some benefit out of it. And as always, if you have any questions, just leave an email to George at Imaginomic, and I'll get back to you just as soon as possible.